Who is that? I think me there. Okay, that is you. Gorilla. Animal. Coco Love. Okay, that's very good. That is you. You are a lovely animal. Delicious. When Penny Patterson and Coco, a western lowland gorilla, met nearly 30 years ago, neither had any idea they would become friends for life. In the long history of human-animal relationships, their story is one of the most fascinating. It is the true tale of a young woman and a gentle giant walking hand in hand into a whole new world of understanding. They couldn't have known that their intimate friendship would shatter century-old stereotypes and change forever our outlook of both gorillas and ourselves. Penny describes her friend with gentle honesty and affection. Coco's about five feet tall. She weighs roughly 300 pounds. A little heavy for a female. The average is 250. She's a big female gorilla. Coco has a, a very strong sense of self. She um, feels she's important. She's got a strong ego. She's playful, very, can be very silly. A quick, a quick spin, a quick, a really quick spin, and then once you're good and busy, <laughs> send you off. She's got a good sense of humor. Oh no, a monster, a monster coming to get the alligator. <laughs> she can be very stubborn, uh, very s willful. Finished, you are not finished. <laughs> you are not, you are not finished. You didn't do the work, I asked. Please pick those up. Coco, you are very good at that. Please pick them up. Their not. relationship is like no other. Penny and Coco are the first human and gorilla to share a common language. Penny taught Coco to speak sign language. Play with them after you help. Okay? No, no, not fake. No. What? Their exchanges, their conversations were enchanting and quickly revealed the power language has to build a bridge between our species. Then you go and you bring those papers. You did, he was visiting you and bit. When I look into Coco's eyes, and other people have said this, that they're, they've changed forever, that there's an exchange of intellect and emotion that that we get with another person. Coco is looking, peering into your eyes and questioning you and asking you and getting information from you, drawing you out. She can do that because she has sign language. By teaching Coco a language humans can understand, Penny armed Coco with a powerful tool that allowed her to speak as an ambassador on behalf of her endangered species. Astonishingly, Coco is willing to provide us a window into her life, her mind, and her heart. Who could have imagined that a gorilla could fall in love with a kitten, search for a mate, and yearn to be a mother? She has challenged us to acknowledge that we share this world with other intelligent animals. There is very little difference. Genetically, it's what, 2%, something like that. When I tell people that we have the same number of hairs per square inch as great apes, they go, no, that's impossible or that we have the same blood types. Oh, come on, you know, that's not right. But it's all true. whose Japanese name, Hanabiko, means fireworks child, was born on the 4th of July in 1971 at the San Francisco Zoo. Coco's first few months of life were not easy. She became very ill and had to be cared for in the zoo's nursery. 
As Coco grew stronger, Penny considered a revolutionary idea. The young doctoral student in the psychology department at Stanford University wanted to work with Coco. She proposed that a gorilla could learn to speak with humans using sign language. My initial expectation was that I would work with her about four years and then I would get my degree and move on. After the first few evenings trying to leave her, I couldn't. I couldn't put her down. So I ended up staying with her until she was asleep. Coco won me over right away. Within a few weeks of working with her, I could never really want to separate from her. You'd have to pull us apart. Dr. Ron Cohn has been the cameraman behind the scenes for nearly 30 years. He helped Penny raise Coco while doing postdoctoral work at Stanford. All the while, he's kept his cameras rolling. His tireless work behind the lens documents the incredible journey of a gorilla growing up in a human family and learning to talk. Encouraged by the little gorilla's eagerness, Penny took the first steps into a new frontier of interspecies communication. She taught Coco her first words, drink, eat, and more. Penny would make the sign for drink and then help Coco do the same. The signs for eat and more came next. If you watch Coco closely, she's learning to put her fingertips to her mouth to sign eat. And her fingertips together to sign more. At first, I think it was almost like, oh, if I do this, then they give me stuff. That was what she got out of it initially. Learning vocabulary was a beginning, but in order to have a conversation, Coco had to learn how to use her new language. Coco proved an adept student. Everyone was amazed at how well the little gorilla was catching on. I think within two weeks, Coco was using sign language. I couldn't believe it. Over the next months and years, Coco's vocabulary grew to over 200 signs. Coco was making unprecedented strides and national news. Penny was happy to report the little five-year-old could not only talk, but was redefining our concept of gorilla intelligence. Coco has performed consistently at a level um, about a year behind a, a child her age. So that she, when you calculate an IQ, which is a ratio, comes out about 85 and 100 is normal, quote, normal. <laughs> what I didn't know then was that gorillas already have their own gestural system that I was just building on, or discovering, you know, depending on the way you looked at it. Only recently, Penny and an associate, Joanne Tanner, discovered that gorillas use a system of gestures to communicate. Joanne has identified dozens of signs as part of their natural gestural language. The discovery of this innate gorilla ability helped explain Coco's remarkable affinity for a human sign language. Using an elaborate verbal language is something unique to humans. We are the only primate with vocal cords developed enough for complex speech. Oh, the dog got old. So he... Today, these third graders are learning a gestural language. Deanne Draper, one of Coco's caregivers, is teaching them American Sign Language, or ASL, the same nonverbal communication system Coco was taught. Gorilla. Right, you guys are great. If she wants to tell you yes, she usually says, good, good. Another one of her signs is chase. Chase, good. This finger, candy. Coco has created her own version of sign language called Gorilla Sign Language, or GSL. She has adapted some signs to fit her large hands and body. You can see this is a imprint here of Coco's father's hand, but his thumb was only about as big as mine. 
when you try to make some of the signs in American Sign Language with a teeny little thumb, it's impossible. This is a K, and the way people do it is, this is Coco. She usually doesn't make the K because there's that thumb thing again, right? She can't reach this one too well, so she usually just does this. Coco love. There you go, Coco love. Visits. Okay. Visits. You guys are very nice visits. Nut sandwich. Nut sandwich. When Coco does hurry, she doesn't just go hurry all the time. She uses different modulations. She uses hurry or hurry or hurry or hurry. What had gone unrecognized is that humans and gorillas share a fundamental ability to learn language. Just like you can't teach language to a child, they learn it. It's, it's that same distinction. It's not training. It's exposing her to something and letting the wiring, the genetic makeup, do what it would normally do. We One day in September 1976, Penny told Coco a surprise was on the way. A baby gorilla was joining the family. Penny and Ron had heard of a young male named Michael who needed a home. They jumped at the opportunity to add him to the family. The goal was to provide not only a companion for Coco, but also a potential future mate. When we first got Michael, I remember opening the cage because I wasn't afraid of gorillas and letting him out. And, you know, he ran right to me and hugged me and sunk his teeth into my shoulder. But, you know, since then, he was very good with me. When Michael and Coco met, Coco was disappointed. She signed wrong, old. She'd been told he was a baby. Michael was already three and a half. Their first few weeks together were a bit difficult. Much like an only child being introduced to a new sibling, Coco wasn't ready to share her world. Ultimately, the youngsters were left to work it out, and their struggles turned into a raucous wrestling match. They eventually settled into a comfortable relationship. When Michael wasn't pestering Coco, they often engaged in a playful game Coco called Quiet Chase, Hide and Seek. Penny soon enrolled Michael in the sign language preschool, and after just 12 months, he had learned more than 20 signs. Over the next three years, Coco and Michael doubled in size, and Penny knew it was time for a more spacious and permanent home. In 1979, Penny and Ron moved their gorilla family from Stanford University into the nearby Santa Cruz Mountains. The six and a half acre site became the new home of the Gorilla Foundation, which Penny and Ron had established in 1976. The secluded woods and nearby orchard provided the gorillas with a quiet sanctuary. They now had a small buffer from the outside world. Here, Penny and Ron could live and work right on the property. And there was plenty of room for spacious play yards to be built for Coco and Michael. By now, an endeavor expected to last only four years had gone on for nearly 10. During this time, the bond between Coco and Penny had matured into an intimate friendship. Observing their interactions reveals a relationship based on respect, trust, and love. You want to tell me about that? What are you doing? Oh, you don't. All right, it's private. I won't bother you then. You 
okay how you feel? I feel nice. You there. Okay. <laughs> Coco was now fluent in signing. She had been given a voice and used it freely to convey her wants and her needs. Why would I owe you a nut? Because you're good? Oh. Like just in. Chase where? You toilet. You go. Do you sleep? <laughs> the obvious emotions that Coco showed me in the beginning were crying, distress, laughing. Oh, tickling her was just, so funny. You gorilla, tickle, catch, okay. All the subtle emotions are there. Um, the guilt. <laughs> what happened? Broke bad, hungry bad. Oh, honey, Coco love. Oh, all right, you'll make up. I give you a kiss. Thank you. At one point, Ron was filming, and I was doing something else, and she's eating paper. She's always trying to s steal little bites and looking like, do they know what I'm doing? I know I'm doing something that is, quote, is bad. No, that's not the way to play with it. Coco was proving daily that she experienced and understood complex emotions, and she had no trouble making her feelings known. There were times like raising children where they drive you nuts and you do shout at them. That's it. Mostly, I think what you're seeing is that she fascinated me. If she had been a hum my human child, I wouldn't have had the same patience. <laughs> Not to say that it wasn't frustrating at times, but that it was tempered by this, this just fascination. What are we doing? <laughs> Coco has always enjoyed looking through books and magazines. She especially likes the pictures and often signs to herself about them. One of her favorite books is The Three Little Kittens. Coco would ask Penny to read it again and again. Lost their mitten, and they began to cry. There was something in the story that seemed to touch Coco. Cry. Cry. Eventually, Coco asked Penny for a real kitten of her own. How do you feel about kitties? Cat Gorilla have visit, Coco love. Good. So Penny did what her friend asked and found a tiny baby cat for the 300 pound gorilla. The story of Coco's relationship with her first kitten became an unexpected means for us to understand the depth of gorilla emotion. When this photograph taken by Ron made the cover of National Geographic magazine, and when the book and video about Coco's kitten were shared with millions, the world was able to see gorillas in a whole new light. Coco has impacted people um, in a sort of a, at a mass level because of that image. The reason that it's so it stands out in people's memories is because there's an emotional surprise there. There's a giant gorilla with a tiny, tiny, tiny helpless kitten and being gentle and loving toward that kitten. Coco rhymed a name for her new kitten. She called him All Ball, because to her, the cat looked like a little ball. Coco adored All Ball, and they spent countless hours playing together. And yet, it was by loving the little tailless kitten that Coco learned one of life's hardest lessons. One evening, All Ball was tragically killed on a nearby logging road. Coco was heartbroken. Coco, All Ball was hit by a car. I went in right away and I said, Coco, something's happened to your kitty and he won't be here anymore. You know, he's, he's the, kid, the cat has died. Penny stayed with Coco to comfort her.
and later privately Coco expressed her grief. Although Coco had experienced love and loss, Penny discovered that in time, her wounds could heal. Soon, boxes and baskets of kittens began to arrive. The world was trying to help Coco find a new feline friend. Oh, the little troubles. Oh, the little troubles. The little troubles, there. You have them all. Coco loved playing with all of them but finally chose another tailless kitten she named Smokey. Today, Coco and Smokey remain two of the world's most extraordinary friends. Over the years, Coco has become world famous. At the tender age of three, she was featured on Nova for her unique ability to communicate. At five, she appeared on the cover of the New York Times magazine. Coco made headlines year after year from Ms. Magazine to Life. When Coco was six, French filmmaker Barbet Schroeder made a film about her life entitled Coco, A Talking Gorilla. At seven, she took her own portrait for the cover of National Geographic. Time magazine chose one of Ron's photos of Coco as a picture of the year. In the 90s, Coco remains a media mogul. Her journal, Gorilla, is distributed worldwide. Membership to the Gorilla Foundation is growing. Mail pours in. And millions visit her website at gorilla.org. Throughout the years, celebrities and journalists have found their way to Coco's secluded home in the hills of Northern California. Comedian Lily Tomlin asked Coco to join her on a People magazine television special all about famous females. Which? Which do you want? She says you want them all. <laughs> Journalist Hugh Downs came calling to tell Coco's story on 2020. Coco also assisted Star Trek's William Shatner in his campaign on behalf of endangered species. How are you feeling, Coco? Fred Rogers, the host of one of Coco's favorite TV shows, PBS's Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, paid her a visit. He has shared Coco's story with millions. Thank you. Want to see that? Really? Well, okay. <laughs> Put them on the other way. On occasion, special friends drop by and Coco indulges her audience with a little showing off. Hey, that's cool. <laughs> oh, that <one's> out. <laughs> that's great, Coco. Hey, Coco. Want to trade? Trade the glasses for something I have in my pocket? Oh. Look. Let's make a deal. Oh, you're pretty good about it. Well, very, very nice. Coco met her youngest visitor even before he was born. This infant's mom, Meg, was one of Coco's caregivers and had visited Coco while pregnant. The baby, Coco. Remember the baby? Stomach. Stomach. Right. Here. You're yes, so stomach smart. Here. Yes. What do you think, Koki? You want to have a baby, Koki? Gorillas reach puberty at about age 10 and begin to express an interest in mating and having babies. Coco and Michael were no different. Without other gorilla role models, it was up to Penny to help Coco understand gorilla reproduction. She had a baby. She had a baby. I knew Coco wanted a baby because the first time I saw it, she said, me, that, to the gorilla on the television screen that was holding a baby. 
very definitely pointing to the baby in the picture. Also, the way that she treats her gorilla dolls, not her human dolls, not her troll dolls, not any other doll, but her gorilla dolls, she takes their hands and makes them sign things. She teaches her baby eat, drink, and more, the first three signs she was taught as a baby. You love drink. Where does the baby drink? Drink, the baby signed, she's got a giant mouth. Drink mouth, she's had the baby answer. The baby said drink mouth. Most important, right. a baby would make Coco happy. And what we want to see is cultural transmission. That's the, the term for it, is that she would actually teach her offspring in the way that we taught her. That Coco might teach her baby to sign is an exciting possibility. She has learned over 1,000 words and uses a vocabulary of 500 regularly. All right, what did you make here? Hat fake. Coco has mastered the subtleties of sign language so well that literal translations don't always capture the complexity of her thoughts. Throughout the decades, Coco's teachers have used both sign language and spoken English. The fact that Coco understands English makes her seem especially human-like. One more and then you turn it off, okay? Good. Let me see your tongue. Tongue looks fine, okay. Coco has truly made sign language her own by inventing or creating totally new signs. Dina, the foundation's lead caregiver, converses with Coco on a daily basis. We say things in English, and if we don't give her a sign for it, she has no way of telling us that that's what she wants. Browse is like the lettuce and greens that we give her between meals and we didn't have a sign for it, and Coco started doing this. And at first people didn't know what it was, and eventually it became clear that she was asking for brows, and it's at the eyebrow, so she was using the sound to come up with a sign, brows. Coco, like any of us, can be frustrated when others don't understand what she's trying to say. I don't understand. Oh, sorry, I <laughs> bad that I don't understand. I'm a little dense, honey. Shame. It's a shame that I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. By putting two descriptive words together, Coco invents compound words that better communicate what she's trying to say. Hair, yes. This is for your hair. <laughs> scratch comb. It's a scratch comb. That's an interesting word for a brush. Nice. I need help with my hair today. Yeah, this side too. She'll create a word if there isn't one. Eye hat for a mask, uh, finger bracelet instead of ring. Almost every conversation or sign Coco has made in the presence of Penny or a caregiver has been dutifully entered into a daily journal. These records are being studied to better understand the structure and meaning of Coco's signing. What I'm trying to do with the database that I'm working with right now is categorize the words that they use. Is it a, a, a modifier word? Is it a, a social word or an emotional expressive word? And they talk about everything. They aren't just asking for food. They aren't asking for rewards. They're talking about things. They're commenting on things. They're going to show people how well they have this, this language in hand. Over the years, Penny has enjoyed watching Michael and Coco's individual personalities emerge. Michael is a totally different personality than Coco. Coco tends to be chatty. Michael is a man of few words, but what he does say is very to the point and on target. Since arriving at the foundation, he has developed a vocabulary of over 500 signs. As he matured, Michael developed a distinctive crest of silver hair across his back and shoulders. He is the alpha or dominant male, a 450 pound silverback, three times as strong as an average man. He is self-reliant and has an active, inventive imagination. An astounding dimension of Michael's character was revealed when he recounted a terrifying memory from his life as a baby in Africa. 
Every day in Africa, logging and poaching threaten gorilla survival. It seems likely that during a poaching raid, Michael witnessed his mother being murdered and butchered for meat. It is with shocking regularity that entire family groups are killed for food. This infant chimpanzee was spared, but his parents were not. When asked about his mother, Michael told Penny a very disturbing story. He signed noise, trouble, and cut neck. Penny believes he was describing how he became a captive gorilla. The Gorilla Foundation hopes that by sharing Michael's story and by raising awareness about how thousands of great apes are hunted and killed each year, the tragedy that made Michael an orphan might stop. There is no way to know the exact impact this memory has had on Michael, but Penny believes it has shaped his personality. Michael is just a totally different individual. He is very, very sensitive, very artistic. He is fond of classical music, and he paints beautifully. Since they were young, both Michael and Coco were surprisingly skillful at expressing themselves through painting. One of Michael's first paintings was of his favorite dog, Apple, whom Michael loved to play chase with. Michael painted his faithful friend from memory and titled it Apple Chase. From the many colors he was offered, Michael deliberately chose only black and white to create this remarkable impression of Apple and a sense of the chase. Coco and Michael surprised the world with their artistic ability. The fact that they select specific colors from a full palette and paint with such purpose and intent is no less than amazing. Excellent. Excellent. When the gorilla's artwork goes on display, Penny and Ron decide which pieces to send to the gallery. When I got to see Coco and Michael's pictures in a portfolio, I was really excited about what I was seeing. And the idea of giving them an art show is really exciting. Michael's art is very emotional. It's full of color, it fills up the page, it has a lot of activity, a lot of action. Michael's paintings are often about how he feels. He paints his emotions with intensity. And his still lifes with surprising finesse. Stink in GSL means flower. Michael painted a large bouquet and entitled his finished work, Stink Gorilla Moor. This painting, Stink Gorilla Moor, looks to me like a vibrant spring bouquet of flowers. You can see where he was lighter with the brush, maybe had some heaviness in certain areas. It's almost like music in the same way you'd vary things. But Coco and Michael aren't the only ones with a creative eye. Ron's photographs have given the world a powerful insight into these magnificent beings. My interest in taking pictures of the gorillas is as great as it was 27 years ago. There is a lot I need for people to see about them. And I'm flattered that uh, the gallery wanted to put some photos in here. And it also helps for people to relate to the artwork that the gorillas do. Especially children, they can see what Coco's and Michael's personality is like. There's a black and white photograph of Michael. He looks half human. And what's eye-catching about that is that people see human-like qualities in an animal. Michael's life story is a compelling one. Since his arrival at the foundation as a toddler, he has offered Coco companionship. But the question remains, 
As an adult, will he become her mate? Coco and Michael's day at the Gorilla Foundation begins with one of their favorite things, food. Deanne, one of the gorilla's caregivers, arrives each morning with boxes of fresh, organic fruit and vegetables donated from a nearby market. A delicious breakfast, lunch, dinner, and several snacks are specially prepared to include lots of the gorilla's personal favorites. Uh, we consider, and the gorillas consider, their food to be the highlight of their day. This is the most important thing to them. She has her favorites. She loves green beans and corn, Brussels sprouts, a few things like that. Coco gets somewhere between 10 and 12 pounds a day. So, we're done. Gorillas sleep about 12 to 14 hours a night, and by 8.30, Ron and Penny personally deliver breakfast with a morning wake-up call. Hello, cutie pie, how are you? Okay, little moon and joy. Coco and Michael have spent many years together. They have developed a strong friendship, but Coco doesn't seem interested in mating. Penny has discovered why. At that time, we didn't understand that when gorillas are raised together, there is a taboo against mating, just as there is with humans. Coco considered Michael her kid brother. The two had developed a sibling bond, not a mating bond. Coco continued to express her powerful instinct to be a mother. She yearned for a baby of her own. Coco, would you like to... Um, so Penny took on the role of matchmaker and went in search of a boyfriend for Coco. Do you know how to do that? With so few males accessible, the search narrowed rapidly. Penny collected videotape of the available bachelors, and Coco began an unprecedented journey into the world of video dating. Okay, you watch the gorilla. Do you like his looks? When Coco was looking at the videos to pick her potential mate, Coco love. It was a thumbs up, thumbs down reaction. <laughs> she just turned the power on. There he is. If she liked the gorilla, <laughs> she would kiss the screen. You kiss him. Do you like him? Good. Do you like him to visit? And she outright rejected others. Gorilla, no! <laughs> <laughs> then along came Endume. <laughs> Purr. Is that what you were telling me? Bring. Do you like Endume on TV? Endume, which means male in Swahili, was the 10-year-old bachelor who caught Coco's eye. Oh my goodness, a big kiss. Do you like Ndume in person? Do you like him to visit? Local press gathered at the Gorilla Foundation to cover the arrival of Coco's new bow. Penny had successfully relocated Endume from the Cincinnati Zoo. 
As ever, Ron was documenting this important moment. And Dume's first steps into the play yard marked the beginning of his new life at the foundation. He had no idea he was joining the famous family of talking gorillas. Indume's secret admirer waited in the wings while he settled in. It didn't take long for Coco to ask to meet Indume face to face. Normal protocol calls for the gorillas to play in adjacent yards for a few weeks, giving them time to get acquainted. But Coco quickly confided in Penny that she wanted to meet Indume now. Visit do there. Good. How do you know to go in there? Huh? How do you know? How do you know that? That's good. Coco, love. Hurry. Good. Hurry. Have nice. Oh, you're going to be nice? Coco, love. Good. Okay. You're going to be nice, huh? Penny honored her request and allowed Coco to enter in Dume's yard right away. Oh, good. <laughs> The question of whether they would get along would soon be answered. Would Indume, half Coco's size and 10 years younger, be nervous on Coco's home turf? Would there be dominance displays or mating invitations? Whatever the message is, we humans are just beginning to understand. Finally, from Coco, an invitation to play. An invitation accepted and returned. Penny watched as the days and weeks passed. Nature took its own course and the relationship between Coco and Indume began to grow. It could be months, even years, before Penny would know if Coco's instincts were right. Was Indume the one who would help her build a family of her own? In an adjacent play yard with his typical independence and good humor, Michael adapted to the life of a bachelor. Over the next few years, Penny intensified her search for a female gorilla in need of a home, this time a mate for Michael. Meanwhile, the trio spent their days doing what gorillas enjoy most, playing, relaxing, and eating. While Coco's biological clock ticked, she and Indume engaged in guerrilla play. They spent years together teasing and roughhousing. And although the rules to guerrilla games like tug of war are simple, the guidelines for successful guerrilla mating are uniquely complex. After years of courting and flirting, why had Coco and Indume not yet mated? Penny believed that Coco might not be at ease in the company of two adult male gorillas. In the jungle, it's a male and up to 12 or 15 females. Never one male, one female. Never, ever. And while we like that setup, a gorilla does not. A female gorilla is very uncomfortable with that, very insecure. And this is really important. She needs that social support. If she had that family, I would sort of fade in importance, and, and I should. You, you could climb 
She w could well outlive me. Marilla's record is 54. She's 27. So that's what I'm striving for, so that if something happens to her human family, she has the more important gorilla family. This is your boyfriend, right? To reinforce the mating bond between Coco and Indume, Penny thought a pep talk might help. It could help you make babies. You gotta get your nerve up though, you gotta go talk to him about it. Mm -hmm. This is the man, right here. Without the support of a typical family group, Coco is less likely to conceive. It's been eight years since Ndume arrived, and still, there is no baby. Coco had nothing to do with being born in a zoo. She had nothing to do with being made a subject of a, of a quote, experiment. That wasn't her choice. And I want to do the best I can for her, so, and for Michael, and for Ndume, and for as many other gorillas as need a safe place, a sanctuary. In Hawaii, the Maui Land and Pineapple Company has donated 70 acres for a tropical preserve that will provide the gorillas with greater freedom. Penny hopes a nearby interpretive center will inspire visitors to conserve habitats for gorillas and for all the world's species. Over the years, Penny's passion for Project Coco has never wavered. Their relationship is magic. Okay. It was magic from the beginning. All right. Oh, we are having a we are having a hug. Her ability to work with animals is unique. I've never known anyone who who could do what she does. Thank you. Check out. Oh. Along the way, Penny's scientific study turned into something far more important. She not only cares for the well-being of her gorilla family but she is also working for the survival of their entire species. Coco, Michael, and Indume have become the heart and soul of her world. People ask, do you have any kids? And I say, no, I have three gorillas. They think that I'm insulting my children, but those, my children are gorillas, I'm sorry. <laughs> and that's probably the way I would have written it if I had complete control over the outcome of my life. Coco's life with humans has afforded us an opportunity to look into the eyes of another animal and recognize our kinship. I think people conceptually find it uncomfortable, but when they see Coco, there's something different. And their conscious and subconscious have to work it out. They're us, we are the naked apes. We are apes, they are us, we are them. There is very little difference. It's just hard for us to accept because they look so different on the surface. But it's just a surface thing. It's, they're like us inside. In Penny's search for a deeper understanding of gorilla intelligence, she found not only that Coco could learn, but that Coco could love. And through their intimate friendship, their conversations, they were able to share with us a rare phenomenon, the opportunity to meet mind to mind with another talking animal. Play, there. <laughs> oh, these guys play with my, my earrings? Those trouble earrings, yes? As for Coco's future, there are still many chapters left unwritten. But from her years of conversing with us, we have at least learned that what it means to be a gorilla is far richer and more complex than we could have ever imagined. seen on this nature program, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org.
a production of WNET, New York. This is PBS.